We had a little technical difficulty, but we can still worship together, yeah? That's a fun song that they play. I always like that song. Um, when you were in school, now some of you are going to have to think back for a minute. <laughs> You're welcome. When you were, what's a pastor that can't heckle her congregation just a little bit, yeah? When you were in school, did you like group projects? No, no, of course you didn't like group projects. Group projects were the worst. It didn't matter what grade you were in. If you were in first grade, if you were in high school, if you were in college, you were in graduate school, group projects all stunk. There was always, and why did you hate group projects? I'm just assuming everybody hated them with equal fervor, just like me. If you did hate it, why did you hate it? Because there was always that one person, right? That one person who didn't want to do their work, who couldn't be counted on, no matter what happened. That group was sink or swim. Everybody got the gr same grade, no matter what. So that slacker got the same grade as you assuming nobody here was the slacker. <laughs> Let me tell you this, though. If you didn't care for that type of thing in school, you're going to hate what I have to say next. I know. Life, my friends, is a group project, and we are all in it together. Let's hear from Luke this morning. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter into it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this. The Lord needs it. Don't y'all wish you could just say that about anything? Like, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The disciples, they have heard Jesus teach and preach and seen him perform miracles for three years now. They have celebrated with him. They have mourned with him. They have uh, eaten with him. They have been in places and accepted generous hospitality. They have been in places where crowds are angry, where leaders are angry and upset with what is being sought and taught. They have been with him, just the group of them, and they have been with him amid thousands. They have seen everything. They have seen the reactions of those around Jesus, those who are joyful, those who are angry, those who are less. But this moment right here, when Jesus gets on that donkey and starts to ride into Jerusalem, it starts to get real like nothing else before. Now, I know sometimes up here I give the disciples a hard time. It's kind of fun to poke at them because sometimes they were really dumb. But their inability to really get what Jesus is trying so hard to show him, show them, I mean, to us it seemed obvious, but 
we have that wonderful quality of hindsight, and we can read it where they didn't. The thing is, is that they tried, right? They genuinely tried, and they kept trying even when or if they didn't understand what Jesus was trying to do because they knew Jesus was someone exceptional, and they loved him, and so they followed him. Now, Jesus needed this parade. He needed to enter Jerusalem in this way, and he needed their help to make it happen. He already knew lots of folks in power were not happy with his teachings, were not happy with his miracles, his messages, his ways of pushing up against the status quo. If there was a button for somebody to push in Jerusalem, Jesus is right there pushing that button. Because he had a way of pointing out where those in power were wrong and were failing their society and their faith. He said, look, folks, we are all in this together, and y'all are not being the good group partners that we need to be having. And at this parade, this moment with the cult and the palms and the people shouting, it is another way to shake things up. It is another way for Jesus to say, I am here and I'm not going to be quiet about how we can do better as a community. In all of Jesus' teachings, we see some common threads. And one of those common threads is that we are interdependent on one another. No matter who we are in society, Jesus knew how dependent we are on one another. Sometimes folks forget that. Sometimes folks forgot that when he was walking the earth. Sometimes folks forget that now. We are dependent on one another. We don't like to remember that, especially if we have a nice comfy life and we think that we can do things by ourselves. If we're not struggling, we like to think that we don't need other people. We don't want to be interdependent with those around us in our society. We might fight against us. We might loudly declare, especially as Americans, we might loudly declare our rugged independence. We might claim we're self-made and we have pulled ourselves up by those figurative bootstraps. Friends, there are no bootstraps and we can't do it by ourselves even if there were because that's not reality. It's not reality. We don't accomplish anything alone. We don't do anything by ourselves. We don't get anywhere without help, whether we like it or not. We need one another. And not just here, in this common worship space, whether we're here in person or online, we can look around the room and say, yeah, I could, I could depend on that person. I could depend on that person. But you know what? When we walk out the doors, we are still as interdependent on the people in our community as we are in here. And that's tough, isn't it? I mean, who wants to depend on other people? With no hands? Of course not. Forming relationships, real relationships, requires us to take risks, requires us to be vulnerable. We might be willing to do that with a couple of people. But even then, it can be kind of iffy to let people in to who we really are. Sometimes, a lot of times, we're too cautious, we're too afraid, or too nervous to let folks know who we really are and what we really need. I'm going to pick on my best friend here for a little bit because she's not here, she won't know. But this week I was talking to her. She wouldn't care, by the way. This week I was talking to her, and I found out her mom was going to have surgery. And I said, your mom's going to have surgery, and her mom lives with her. And I said, what do, you, what do you need? Can I bring you a meal? Can I go sit with you in the hospital? What do you need for me? And she goes, oh, I'm fine. Everything's fine. 
I'm fine. Like that meme with everything on fire behind, and she's standing there going, I'm fine. And now we've been friends a long time, so you know you have those friends you can talk a certain way to, that you can't talk that way to everybody. And I said, okay. I said, are you really fine? Or are you saying that because you always think you have to do things by yourself and you can't ask for help? There's a little bit of a pause there. And she said, well, you know what? I really am fine. But if I'm not, I promise I will let you know. And I accepted that. But also I'm going to check on her later on this week to see if that I'm fine has changed. Now, just to be fair, I'm not saying that people couldn't have that conversation with me. It seems to me that a few of you have had that conversation with me in the past couple of months. It's a conversation that anybody could have with any of us, right? I mean, how many times has somebody asked you if you're fine in a difficult situation, and you just say, I'm fine, like you're voice goes up five octaves, because you're not fine. Sometimes we genuinely are fine, and it's okay. But sometimes we're not. And when we're not, we don't want to admit that we need help. I mean, that's like a weakness. That's like letting somebody else tug on those bootstraps. Now, while Jesus isn't shown having some deep conversation with his disciples about what's going to happen in this moment, he is shown asking them for help. He needed them to help him, and so they did. Because their relationship was built in such a way he had taught them from example to care for one another. So let me ask this. When was the last time you asked for help? It's been a minute, has it? Of course it has. Most of us don't like doing that. Especially if it's like parents asking kids for help. Like, that's never going to happen, right? Or pastors asking their congregations for help. Like, that's not going to happen. We can think of all sorts of people who are not going to ask for help. I don't know why. We live in an interesting time, a time unlike any other in some ways because of the technology that we have. We have all of this technology at our fingertips, and it seems like those are tools that should connect us, to help us share more of ourselves with one another, to ask and receive help in real ways. We live in a time when those means of communication are just so close and easy to use and what is happening? We are drifting further and further apart. We're becoming more isolated. There are studies that show we are becoming more isolated. We are lonelier. We are more depressed. We are more anxious than we used to be. Rates of addiction have increased greatly. Now, we could say some of that is due to the pandemic and the, the residual feelings and, and such from that pandemic, but that's not all that is. Those rates have, have come down from their pandemic highs, but they still haven't gone down to pre-pandemic levels. We are more isolated, we are more depressed, we are more anxious than we used to be. And we have to ask ourselves as a community, why is that? What does it mean to form and belong to community? See, that's what Jesus and his disciples were creating for three years, community, with one another and with the people that they ministered to. It is clear to us that some of those communications, some of those connections were clearly memorable and powerful because we remember them thousands of years later. And one writer and pastor wrote that interdependence is not always the focus of this passage. When you read it, it might not be the first thing you think of. But Jesus' retort 
back to the Pharisees, we can see that all creation will cry out if justice, if love, if the beloved community is not honored and uplifted. Supporting one another, caring for one another, asking for and receiving help, giving help is built within the foundations of our creation. If it's not there in our relationships, creation notices the very rocks could cry out. In a conversation with Kate Bowler, this series is based on, she interviewed a woman named Bia Birdsong, author and family activist. Mia shared that community is too often a buzzword, an empty noun without action. But the community she describes isn't community for community's sake. This is the hard work of interdependence. Here's that word again, interdependence. Figuring out where I end and where you begin. Community as a verb, the work of belonging takes all of us. She writes that all the horrors we face today will only be solved if we understand that we are in this together. We are most moved toward action by our relationships with others. We need, we need to develop a sense of belonging in and around the world that tells us other people are ours to care for. The thing is, we need community. And we need to help people. That's always easier than the asking for it, isn't it? We need community. That hasn't changed over the entirety of human existence. We all need our people. We all need the people who we call when the chips are down and who we know will bring us dinner or, I don't know, a bottle of wine and listen to us vent and cry and rage and do whatever it is that we need to do. It's okay to be needy sometimes. It's a great fear of ours to be needy. It's okay to admit that we can't be truly self-sufficient. It might be with the family we were born with that we have that ability. It might be with the family we were raised with. It might be with the family that we've had to create as adults, because those other ones don't work out that way. But whatever it is, it's okay to admit to our people that we need help and we are here to help them. Again, Kate Bauer, in the opening of her podcast every week, she says in one way or another, we can have beauty and meaning, community and love, and we will need each other if we're going to tell the truth. If we're going to be honest. We have to admit we need one another because life is a chronic condition and there's no cure for being human. We are human together, my friend. We are human together and all in the same group project. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, you set your face toward Jerusalem, walked along those who suffered. Be our vision, God, that we too may walk in the way of compassion and extend a hand to those we meet. Help to heal the sick and tend to those broken in body, mind, or spirit. Be our vision, God, so that we may too be a source of healing to all in need of your grace. Jesus, you said the first shall be last and the last first. Be our vision, God, that we may work towards your realm when the marginalized and the oppressed will be raised up and know that they are indeed beloved children of the holy. Jesus, you took the time to pray and be silent. Be our vision that through our prayers, meditation, and reflection, we may draw closer to you and find our way on this journey of faith. You enter Jerusalem with peace in your heart.
Be our vision that we can live as people of peace in face of the world's many conflicts. May we hold your vision of justice and peace ever before us. Bless us, O oh God, the days ahead of us. We will need your power and presence to sustain us as we move forward. Amen.